Hey guys, Spirit of the Law here. If you recently got into Age of Empires 2 with the Definitive Edition, then you may not recognize this gem. But the original Age of Kings in HD had a pretty cool intro video. It's two lords or kings playing chess with each other, with the boomer playing the white pieces and the millennial playing the black pieces. Of course, millennial in this context is referring to the turn of the second millennium AD. The concept of the video is it cuts back and forth between their moves and the real soldiers being represented by the pieces. If they move a knight or take a piece, then you see the corresponding action happen as a result. It does a good job reminding you that games from chess to Age of Empires are representing some pretty heavy stuff, and it even gets a little dark at the end, with a soldier crying and dropping a chess piece. It really holds up, and a lot of people, including me, have very nostalgic feelings about the intro. For this video though, I want to analyze the chess game that's being played. It appears they put quite a bit of effort into making it a real game and following the rules of chess. But beyond that, are the moves actually any good and which lord is going to win? I was curious what a modern chess engine and analysis would make of it, so let's check it out. Right away, something that helps is a lot of the pieces are recognizable, and we get quite a few different angles of the board as the moves are played as well. In this shot, we can see quite a bit of white setup, with a rook, some pawns, a king, queen, and a bishop. In another screenshot, we see some of blacks, with a rook, pawn, knight, queen, king, and bishop as well. During some panning, we even see parts of the board multiple times, and the pieces stay in consistent places after the first move. So I've gone through and reconstructed the board. This is the game, and it's white's turn to move. Most of the pieces are actually in reasonable positions, except for the bottom left corner. The bishop on b1, for example, shouldn't be possible, as it starts on f1, and neither pawn that block it in has moved at this point. The only convoluted explanation I could come up with is the a2 pawn promoted to a bishop, then zigzag back, and the current a pawns got there by capturing pieces. That's the only explanation I can think of, and the queen on a1 is also a little awkward. Obviously the bishop needs to be there or the black knight has a soul crushing fork on c2. Either way, we'll just accept the board as it is and explain it away as maybe the players set it up incorrectly. If you want to test your chess skills and haven't already, then take a moment if you like and pause the video to think about what move you would make here as white. Now that you've had a moment to think about it, honestly, this isn't looking great for white in this position. In fact, the chess.com analysis tool gives black a 9 pawn advantage here, so short of a major blunder, black should have this game in hand. Right away as white, you might be tempted to take the knight with your pawn. It's a great move, except for one thing. It immediately leads to the black rook checkmating your king. The king can't escape and it also can't take the rook because it's protected by the queen. So you just straight up lose the game if you take the knight and let's not make that move. Instead, white's best move here is to castle and get the king to safety. That way if the black rook makes the same attacking move it's not an immediate threat. White's best move is to then take the knight and even if black keeps pressing with the rook and queen you can block with the bishop. White is still losing but can stall for a bit which is probably their best play for now. Another idea that might look promising but isn't all that great is to block with the bishop as it's protected by the queen and it even opens up a new flight square for the king to escape to. The problem is if you follow it through you're giving up the bishop for free or losing your queen and a bishop for a rook. So again castling is definitely the best move. Now that said castling as a rule wasn't widely adopted in western Europe until the 1600s so given the time period that may not have been an option here in which case white is in a lot of trouble. The move we see played by white in the intro is pawn to e3. That does get rid of the immediate threat of checkmate, but still leaves white open to a skewer. The only legal move after rook d1 is to move the king to e2, and you just dropped a rook, giving black an even larger advantage. e3 isn't ideal, but it keeps white alive. The king actually looks pretty proud of himself after making the move, and that's the face of someone who just got out of checkmate and won. Black, in response, maybe didn't see the free rook he could pick up. Instead, he moves his knight to g6. This is a pretty passive move, and while the knight is attacking two pawns, they're both defended, and it also gave up protection of the f5 pawn. It doesn't seem to accomplish anything new, while meanwhile the b4 knight is still under threat. I could see someone realistically making this move though, maybe with an idea to get the bishop out and pile up on the h pawn with a knight, bishop, and queen. It's a bad move, but kind of a realistic bad move at the same time. So with white to move, again, castling or taking the free knight would make the most sense, but instead the king plays pawn e4, again pushing the same pawn. The computer absolutely hates this move and says it's now checkmate in 5 for black. The line is rook to d1, where the king is forced to move now to e2, and then the queen comes down giving check. You can't take the queen because it's defended by the rook. 
Again, there's only one legal move for the king, and the queen now gives check again, this time defended by the knight, so the king has to run back, and you give another check with rook at d2. The king has two moves, and after either of them, the next move is checkmate. That's a pretty tricky line to see though, and probably the skewer and free rook would be the most common response from the average player. Now white's idea with the pawn might be to pressure black's f-pawn and threaten the knight, and if the black pawn takes yours then you can keep pushing toward the knight anyway, so now you have two different knights that you're attacking. Black's response to the pawn push is again incredibly passive. He moves the rook forward one square, maybe trying to protect his knight. Again, the other knight is still hanging though, and this doesn't really help Black apply any more pressure in a situation where he's already completely winning. In the intro, I like how they transition after this move to show it's literally being built in a new spot, as if they just pack up the tower and move it every time the rook moves. White's response to this is, again, to push the pawn. I mean, you have to be at least a little scared here that this is going to prompt Black into making the correct move and skewer your king. Again, I love when they pan the camera and you can see the pawn is just sitting happily beside the knight, like both players haven't noticed it. It does make for an interesting visual of white having two attacks going on at once though, and it gives the impression that white is actually winning the game. Now that the rook is under threat, they cut to a trebuchet setting up in sight of the tower, as if white's next move is going to be to take it down. It's a really nice parallel showing the threat white is creating on the chessboard and how that translates. Black's response is to swoop in with the knight and take the pawn. We get the visual of knights coming in and cutting the trebuchet ropes, and the trebuchet falling apart, crushing the engineers. The king is completely shocked by this move, like he can't believe he missed it, while the other king smirks at him. In reality though, it's a terrible move for black, and just gives up your knight for a pawn. White can just recapture and apply the exact same pressure again, with the same two pieces under attack. White though, just really doesn't seem to want to take any knights, and instead he moves the bishop to g3, maybe trying to defend his two pawns. Unfortunately, that's a major blunder and sets up mate in two. With the rook coming down, the king now has two squares available, and either one leads to mate with queen d2 because now f3 is covered by the knight, so the game has turned into back and forth blunders. Instead of capitalizing on the obvious blunder, black responds with the aggressive looking rook to d2, even shaking the board as it lands. Now it might look scary, but it doesn't actually put an immediate threat on white's king. At this point, both of Black's knights are hanging, and you could even take with the queen to put Black's king in check. If he does something silly like king to d7 and blocks the queen, white could then pick up the rook for free, and according to the computer analysis, white in this position would be winning. What we get instead though is white takes the rook with his king. Looking back at the position though, you actually can't take the rook as it's defended by the queen. That would be an illegal move, and theoretically depending on how strict they're being could forfeit the game. It's kind of confusing, as it seems up to this point the intro was following the rules of chess. That didn't sit right with me, so I did some research and it turns out the queen and bishop pieces in the Middle Ages acted differently and were a lot less powerful. Originally, the queen could only move one square diagonally, or two squares on its first move like a pawn. That'd be pretty impressive if whoever designed the game did enough research to create a move that would be illegal with modern chess rules, but legal during the time period the game was supposedly played. Some of the earlier moves actually make quite a bit more sense if you take the queens out of the game or pretend they can only move one square. Without a queen defending it, you can't do the skewer with the rook, or white would just take with his king, since there's nothing defending it. The moves made are still not the best ones, and the level of play is quite poor, but it explains why that particularly obvious move didn't happen. So just to recap, we had white push a pawn, a little bit of maneuvering with black's knight, another pawn push, a really passive rook move by black, yet another pawn push by white, which black then blunders by capturing, and white then blunders by moving his bishop, then the rook comes down and finally gets captured by the king. According to the analysis, at this point black still has the advantage, but only one good move according to the engine. It recommends knight to c4, because it's explosive, and also to give check. The king could then move away, or it could challenge the knights, and either way you're going to lose the pawn on a3. Even if you challenge the knights, you can't take the one on b4 because it's defended by the bishop, but likewise, white's bishop is defended by the rook. Black's up two knights for a bishop and a pawn, and theoretically black has the advantage, though if he keeps throwing away pieces, I actually think white still has a chance here. So that's a breakdown of the intro chess game for Age of Empires 2. I'm honestly impressed they went to the effort of creating a real chess game with logical moves, and extremely impressed if they intentionally factored in time period appropriate rules. That's all for this one though, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.